very exciting. Welcome back to Murder to Drag. Let's go ahead and call it season two because I've been gone since December. First off, if you are actually watching this, hi, welcome to my YouTube channel. Ever since I started this podcast back like a little over a year ago, I've always joked about like, oh yeah, and by the way, you can't see me, but I'm wearing the biggest wig that you could ever imagine and seven inch stilettos, but I kind of wanted that to be a reality rather than just some fantasy that I was talking about with you guys. And I also realized that many people listen to these podcasts or watch videos to relieve stress and anxiety. It builds sometimes from listening to too much murder or watching too many things or researching too much. And sometimes that helps to calm some anxieties because you have some weird sense of preparedness. I also um, came across this channel on YouTube, Bailey Sarian, sorry, lost the name in my notes there for a second. She has this channel called Murder, Mystery, and Makeup, and she goes ahead and tells her true crime gig while she paints a mug. When I saw her, I was like, okay, I want to do that too. So I sent messages, I sent tweets, I have the receipts, I doubt she's going to respond to me. It's different. My podcast is different. It's been around for about a year. It's all based on queer true crime, hosted by a drag queen, coming from a queer perspective, you know, all that good stuff. I tell ya, things are gonna be easier when I get a new camera. So this week, um, we're back into podcast mode now, everybody, get ready. Oh, I lied to you. I lied to you all once again in my life. I think it's important to stay up front and open about mental health, especially in the position that I'm in with this podcast. And after um, my last episode, Trauma Extravaganza, in December, um, I told you guys that I had learned I inadvertently watched a snuff film as a preteen <laughs> and to um, get back into therapy. It inspired me to get back into therapy and work through some of my own issues. Returning to Murders of Drag now, stronger, better. I'm ready to rock, ready to rumble. Let's do this thing. This one in particular happened back in December and I was going to do an episode about it come January. However, December was a rough month and January seemed to follow suit and then all of 2020 seemed to follow suit even better. I don't like to um, like half do these videos or these podcasts. See, I always called it a video. I knew it was gonna one day become videos and especially when it concerns somebody who's no longer with us and somebody who deserves that attention to detail. And I want to be able to give that. And I don't want to be at half my capacity when I'm trying to tell people stories who really deserve to have their stories told. That's my entire point of having this, this channel, this podcast. Kevin Richard Bacon was born in Schwartz Creek, Michigan in November 28th, 1994. Um, by all accounts, he was a happy-go-lucky kid. He had a lot of room in his heart for the outcasts. The people who didn't quite fit in could always kind of be friends with Kevin because Kevin was there to accept anybody with open arms no matter what. He was an artist in his community. He loved makeup and hair. He actually worked at a salon um, and specialized in like crazy colors, kind of like this which is really hard to do. And I have a lot of respect for people who do colors like that, like Kevin. He was a very talented um, hairdresser and just artist all around, loved makeup, wore makeup himself. It was great. Very good, very talented. He really knew how to work those unnatural colors in the hair. Um, I've tried some of the colors that he had and they've not looked good on me, but every color he did looked good on him. Every single one because he knew what he was doing, which is kind of an important part. Kevin graduated from Schwartz Creek High School in his hometown. Um, he was a graduate from the class of 2013. And after he graduated, he actually went on to get his cosmetology license from Sharps Hair Academy in Grand Blanc, Michigan. By 2019, Kevin's life was really starting to take shape. He was doing everything that he planned on doing, everything that he wanted to do, trying to kind of get right in his head with the self-esteem it's hard, especially in the gay community. It's easy to get into a place where 
you don't think that you fit in because there's these impossible standards that have been set by our own community and media surrounding our community and there's these stereotypes and it's just it's very hard to kind of find where you fit in with all that when you first get exposed to this culture you're like wow there's a lot going on where is my place here so i think that's kind of where kevin was at in his life he was um rooming with his best friend it's just it's the ideal situation for a 25 year old honestly he had all of his ducks in a row um, you could say, and he was attending university in Michigan as well to further his education. Like I said, the self-esteem and self-image really runs rampant in the gay community. It's, th there's a thing that they call gay loneliness, which, which is a strange, strange phrase when you think about it alone, but it, it kind of refers to the fact that most gay people are afraid of putting themselves out there because we've put ourselves out there so many times with coming out and put ourselves out there so many times with being very flamboyant or being just being ourselves. We put ourselves in danger. We put ourselves out there and sometimes we get hurt mentally, physically, emotionally. And after a while you build up these walls and you don't, you don't let them down for many people. So you end up, a lot of people end up alone and, or with very small groups, socially, romantically, usually nothing. Um, Anyway, according to Kevin's roommate and best friend, Michelle Myers, Kevin struggled to have love for himself for a long time. He, he um, had just recently really started with his self-affirmation and just trying, working really hard to love the skin that he was in. He would get tattoos, very colorful tattoos, to kind of help that, to be able to look in the mirror and, and see beauty. Because like I said, he was an artist and he loved the colors and loved everything colorful. So that was kind of his way of helping himself get out there, helping himself out of that dark place. Like many gay men, myself included, Kevin had an account on Grindr. Um, and he was just looking for dates, looking for hookups, what else? And in 2019, meets a man. This is where the dirtbag Mark Latunsky comes on the scene. In 2019, Mark is 50 years old, he's living in Michigan, and he's on all of the gay dating sites. So Mark is using um, Grindr and Scruff and these apps as well, and he's advertising his leather fetish and his very expensive leather gear that he has, and that's how he's kind of luring people in with this expensive gear. He's kind of the bear type, he's got a uh, beard, he's scruffy, uh, white supremacist eyes, you know, you know the type. So this Mark character dude barely ever uses his real name and goes by Oilikos Kai Lucas. O-L-Y-K-O-S. Oilikos, I'm assuming? I'm not sure. But that's all, that's his handle on all of his social media. Probably because he had a lot of stuff in his past that he didn't want people to start looking into. Mark was actually married to a man, Jamie Arnold, for three years. Jamie claims that he ultimately left Mark after not being able to take Mark's constantly having men over for sex and, you know, digging up that dirt on him about his ex-wife. Speaking of whom, prior to his marriage to Jamie, Mark had been married to a woman with whom he had four children. His wife actually took him to court and charged him with custodial kidnapping of two of his four children, which means he took them without permission. There was no custody set up for him to have. He just took them. He kidnapped them. Um, he was placed in outpatient care after this charge was brought up because they found him unfit to stand a trial. This is how unstable this man was. This is in court, unstable, unfit to stand trial. They sent him for outpatient treatment to a facility, which means you're not in anywhere, you're, you're at home, but you're going to doctor's appointments and you're getting treatment from home um, for eight months before he was ultimately deemed fit to stand trial. On August 22nd, 2019, Mark's ex-wife files for a motion to completely suspend Mark's parenting time due to actual diagnoses of paranoid schizophrenia and traits of a personality disorder in 2012 and 2010. Mark was arrested in July of last year, a month after the motion was filed, for failing to pay child support once again, and found himself in jail for only four days, exactly 
A month and two days before meeting his eventual victim, Mark had a 29-year-old man over um, from Grinder or Scruff or something to hook up. He told him, I guess this, they're both into leather, these guys. Um, and it just, there's common theme seems to be that gay men who are into leather or anybody who's into kink deserves if they're murdered or deserves any violence against them, which is absolutely disgusting. A few hours into this hookup, neighbors were very alarmed to hear screaming outside and see a man running down the street in nothing but a leather kilt in 40 degree Michigan weather, screaming, help me, help me, he's after me, holding the phone to his ear, indicating that he's probably on the phone with the cops. The cops come, Mark tells them that he was only chasing him because this guy was wearing his $300 leather kilt. And um, otherwise, Mark wouldn't care. Mark would just let him go. But if he, he had the leather kilt on, so he had to come back, obviously. And the man who was terrified and screaming for his life was willing to just give, give the kilt back and get the fuck out of there. That's not even the only time that he has, that Mark is involved in an insane incident like this. A few months earlier, Another 46-year-old man who met uh, Mark on a gay dating app as well scaled the fence at Mark's house and ran away terrified because Mark, quote, spooked him. Christmas Eve 2019, it's 5.23 p.m. and Kevin tells his BFF slash roommate Michelle that he is going to meet a guy that he met from Grindr and that he would be home later. Pulls out, then that's the last time anybody sees him alive. About an hour after leaving home, he tells her that he's having a really good time and that he might not make it home that night. And this isn't uncommon for Kevin to, to text if he's not going, if he's gonna be out for the night, he's gonna text somebody and he's gonna tell them where he is and should be there to text them as first thing in the morning when he wakes up. So the next day, Christmas morning, um, his parents start setting up breakfast and they realize that Kevin isn't there. So they call Michelle and she says that he went out last night and told her that he might not make it back and she hasn't seen him since or heard from him, which obviously causes panic with the family. So the family contacted the Michigan State Police to open a missing persons report and file the missing persons report officially on Kevin so that they could get him found and get a team out there looking for him. Kevin's car is eventually recovered in the Dollar General parking lot, but what's alarming is that all of his cash, the clothes that he was wearing, and his ID and wallet are in the car. Four days after he was last seen, and three days after he was reported missing, police are led to the home of Mark Litunsky from Kevin's grinder history. They pull up to his house and it's this deceivingly adorable little bi-level, maybe even a one story with that has this little like, I don't know what it's called, but it reminds me of the thing from Hocus Pocus that's on the top of Max's house where the witches break in. It's not a widow's walk. I almost want to call it a widow's peak because it's on the peak of the roof, but I know that's a hairline, so that's not right. But um, when they ask Mark if they can search it, he surprisingly says yes. And almost immediately, police find a, what they put in quotes, secret room. So I'm assuming that means it wasn't too secret. In the basement, where they find a very gruesome scene and they find Kevin deceased. So they let his family know and they start the investigation. Later on, police on the scene described what they saw. They found 25 year old Kevin hanging upside down by rope that had been bound around his ankles. Um, Latensky admitted to stabbing Mark once in the back and then cutting his throat, which is assumed to be the cause of death, the slashed throat, um, and then hung him upside down in that room in his basement. I mean, these truly are just, it sounds like a horror movie. To make matters worse, Mark admitted to the murder and walked police through what he did. We know that he hung him upside down, cut his throat. He then went on to sexually mutilate Kevin and attempt to cannibalize parts of um, Kevin's genitals. The small town setting of this murder and, and the real close-knit community 
And the shocking, gruesome details of this murder caused it to gain a lot of national attention really quickly. Um, so news stations everywhere were picking up the story and calling it um, the Grinder Cannibal case. Kevin's father, Carl, immediately looked into the criminal past of his son's murderer and noticed a pretty disturbing pattern, Mark using the mental health defense and generally dragging things out so long that his charges are dropped. Kevin's parents obviously were grieving this unimaginable loss and this and working through this unimaginable pain and all the while sitting through the trials and the proceedings of Mark and making sure that nothing slips through the radar which means they were present at the proceeding when Mark once again was deemed unfit to stand trial. However, unlike the other crimes where they've played this waiting game and just waited until the victim eventually drops the charges or gives up on the case before he's deemed fit to stand trial and then trial's declared, you know, either thrown out or declared a mistrial, whatever happens. Murder has no statute of limitations. Meaning you can murder somebody in 1920 and still be found guilty in 2020. So essentially they sent him to um, Michigan's Forensic Institute in saline for treatment and he's locked away in there he is not out he is locked up but he has not been convicted so basically if while he's in this facility they ever at any point deem him um sane enough or fit enough to stand trial he will stand trial because of there being no statute of limitations on murder he's he's not going to get away with this I don't think that Kevin's family would let that happen. They've been on the case of the police there and the the prosecutors since the start, and I don't think that they're going to let up at all now that he's in, in a treatment facility. I think, if anything, they'll even become stronger in their will, knowing that these things usually get thrown away when it gets to this point. His parents have actually started making um, funds and foundations to start scholarships and organizations in Kevin's name and to donate and do good in his memory, to keep his memory alive and keep that energy that, that people remember so much about Kevin, that he was this bright young man who had nothing but love for everybody that he came across. He accepted the outcasts like many of us in this community do or have friends that do or no friends or are friends with people who accepted us because we were outcasts. I truly find it insane that but people who do something like this to another human being when you are if when you have enough cognition to do what mark did and mutilate somebody like that sexually mutilate somebody like that and tie them by their ankles and hang them upside down and have let alone have the secret room in your basement at all and have people live with you and be around you and know you and not raise any red flags. It just feels like such a preventable thing. With with a character like this, you just know something's gonna go wrong and it feels like such a preventable thing. But at the end of the day, there's not a whole lot that you can do to arrest him. Unless he's in the position of not paying child support or or custodial kidnapping like he was, but people, in his life seemed almost scared of him or I'm not sure if it was fear or pity if they were if they felt bad for him that he was lonely because he actually went to his husband's friend's house or his husband's house who had friends over because mind you they're not divorced and they weren't divorced um it's his current husband they haven't gotten divorced yet still he goes over to his friend's house Christmas day which is only a few hours after he's brutally murdered and partially dismembered a person on Christmas Eve, nonetheless. And he decides, yeah, he's going to go over to his husband's and see some friends for Christmas. And he gets, he drives there, he makes it there on his own, um, and his husband reports nothing out of the ordinary. He didn't seem strange, 
didn't, nothing was off. I think when a lot of people hear the old see something, say something adage, they feel like they're being blamed for not saying something, which isn't really the case. But if you do see something and you decide to keep it to yourself or decide for yourself that it's inconsequential, then yeah, blame can partially lay with you. I mean, it's being negligent. Anyhow, my theory is that if if this case goes anything like Mark's past cases, he will eventually be deemed fit to stand trial and he will eventually be charged with these crimes. From what I've read around, Kevin's family and friends have been keeping his memory alive with pictures, posts, candlelight vigils, memorial services. They're really, the community is doing a good job of remembering him and they're doing a good job of not sensationalizing the fact that Kevin was gay and not sensationalizing the fact that Kevin was involved with the kink scene or with the leather scene, but instead just mourning him as a murder victim and mourning him as somebody who lost his life. I'm hoping that a few years from now, some kind of law is passed or some kind of motion is filed to make murderers who are deemed unfit to stand trial still receive consequences. But anyways, that's the story of the murder of Kevin Bacon. And that's a little bit about Kevin Bacon's life. The past few weeks have really been taxing, y'all. And I know I'm not the, the one who's had the most stress over these past few weeks. Obviously, the people with the most stress over the past few weeks have been the black folks who are once again being forced to protest at one of the most inconvenient times to be protesting because murderers are once again murdering people. And I've been out protesting a few times now you know, like a week straight, basically. And I've just, you know, I've been trying to be as supportive as possible to all of my friends who are really dealing with this head on and doing a great job. And I've just tried to be out there and be besides them as much as possible, support, the bail funds, donate what I can. And, you know, everybody's got a part they can play. Everybody's got something that they can do. Here I back am making podcasts. I'm trying to clean up my language a little bit so that I can follow YouTube's ad standards. <gasps> I almost forgot blush. I mean, we need this contour <laughs> to be Shrek level contour. I mean, big donkey contour. Garbage, garbage person. I'm a garbage person doing garbage things. I'm so sorry. So I'm gonna call this video a success because this is a look. Um, pointers for next time, choose a makeup look before I start filming. Do not put nail gloves on before unbuttoning a shirt. And three is maybe don't look like this next time. <laughs> maybe do a little, a little bit better. I got to work on a few things. Podcasters, you might hear a little bit of filler. Things might sound a little dragged out this time. That is 100% because I'm trying to sync up my storytelling time with my makeup and getting ready time, which should should be good. I think I think I've got a good form, a good a good amount of time in this episode. I'm so glad I'm doing videos now. So I will see you guys with better equipment next time, hopefully.